nothing better than to start the service off with an interview with Satan and Pastor Tim. Can we give it up for having interviews with the craziest of the crazies? I'm so glad that you guys are here today at this service. I'm excited to be um, here talking about our next series, which is called Truth Bombs. Um, what we want to do during this series for the next four weeks is to just blast some truth your way so that we can walk away stronger and more equipped and be able to face those challenges that come our way. And so I'm excited to be here for the first week and I'm going to ask you, would you mind just standing with me for just a minute, please? I've just really loved being able to stand for the word as we read this together, and I'd like for you just to kind of read along with me as we stand and just honor God's word. John 8, 31 through 32 says this, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. Just join with me as we pray. If you could just bow your heads for just a minute. God, we just want to honor you today. And we want to say this day is all about you. And Father, we know that you have some truths to invade our mind with, God. I pray that you just inject those into our hearts. Father, that you find those places that we're a little leery of giving up to you, God, but you show us that it's okay, that this is a safe place with you, God, that you want more for us as we walk out of this place that even when we came in. So God, I pray that you keep me behind the cross, God, that only the words that you speak will come forth, God, and they would just penetrate the hearts and the minds of every person who's here today, God. We just say we love you, we glorify you, it's because of your son Jesus that we do all of this. And everyone in the house said amen. Before you sit down, just slap somebody and say, it's gonna be a great day. So there is just something about knowing the truth. There's something about knowing the truth, especially the truth that we learn from God through Jesus. I mean, some of the truth that we learn just takes the bondage away from our sins and our past, and we end up walking into a place that has freedom and that we're away from the religious things that keep us all tied up. And what I want to talk about today is what it means to really know the truth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to formulate some things. I'm going to give you some information up in the front to talk about what it looks like to know the truth. And then we're going to go on the back end with some, some things that will help you take some handles and to walk away from today that I hope that you will feel stronger than what you did when you came in. So when my girls were younger and they would do something wrong, yeah, they did wrong things. And we would get into grade school and get into middle school and they would do some things that they were not supposed to do. And I would look at them and I'd say, you know what, you, you gotta just come here for a minute. Just come over here for just a second. Just stand right here. I, I need for you to look me in the eyes. Anybody else do that? I need for you to stand here and pay attention, look me in the eyes. So we'd be looking at the, in, in the eyes, I'd be looking into their, basically down into their soul and I was saying, you know what? You know what you did was wrong. You know that there were some things that I taught you that would have prevented that from happening in your life. I mean, you're a sidler. Like, you know better, right? You know better. The other kids around you, they might not know better. They not, might not have been taught the same things that you were taught. But here's what I know, is that you know better. And you know, it's been said in circles, and I've heard this go around, that we cannot be held responsible and accountable for things we do not know. So while I'm talking to my kids, and I have them look me in the eyes, and I say to them, you know better, you know they know better. Because they know what they had been taught. They knew exactly what I meant when I said that. You know, I taught them things to help them in life when they went to school. I taught them things to prevent them from getting into trouble. And if they would have just applied what they knew, right? If they would have just applied it, there wouldn't have been as many groundings in the Seidler household. There wouldn't have been as many wooden spoon moments, if you know what I mean, right? Don't judge me. We were a little bit of spankers. I don't know if you are or not. But listen, I think God's saying us today to so many of us, you know better. 
And that's where we're going to land today. And as a pastor and a pastor of this church, what I want to do today is give you some truths because I believe we need to be taught some things in order to help us in life. And I think if we're Jesus followers and we know better, then we have a different path than someone who doesn't. And maybe that's you today. You've come in here today and you don't know anything. And we want to give it up for you. Now, yeah, let's give it up for you. Not because you don't know anything, but because this whole thing is questionable and you might have some doubts and we welcome those doubts. God welcomes those doubts today. So we're really glad you're here if that's where you are. And I want you to just think about something for just a minute. I want you to rest in the fact that you might not know at all. But I want you to rest in the fact and knowing that when you leave today, you're going to know better. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm going to know better. And say it louder to the other person on the other side of you. I'm going to know better today. See, there is a moral truth, God's moral truth, that oversees, overrides any other truth there is. Not everything that everyone says is truth. Just because I think it's true, just because you think it's true, doesn't mean it's true. When I was a little girl in grade school, this story is just absolutely crazy when I think about it. There was a little girl in my classroom who told me, you know, when we go to a traffic light, my mom, when the light turns green, she stops. And when the light turns red, she goes. And she said, that's the truth. And you know, I believed it. And I took that back to my dad and we would stop at a light. I would go, dad, you can, you can stop on green and you can go on red because so-and-so said that her mom does that and that must be the truth. And so many of us today, I think we find these truths and these things that we think we believe and we hold on to them as the moral truth and the gospel truth when it's not God's truth, amen? And we're, so what we wanna talk about today is we wanna know better. We want to understand some things that if there are things that we are calling God's truth, then there must be something on the other side called lies. So we're going to look at both today. And we're going to start at a foundational level. I want to level the playing field. And I want to start with something very, very simple. We're going to go through a little bit of a process through this message today. The first thing I want you to understand is this. Number one, you have a spiritual enemy. We call him Satan, we call him the devil, we call him the evil one, we call him a fallen angel. Here's what the Bible says. He, the devil, has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, we have a spiritual enemy that lies to us. Let's just get it out there. He is not like most of the pics that we see. In fact, he's not like the interview that we had with him. He doesn't look like that all the time. He doesn't look like this slithering snake that's on your sidewalk or this serpent that's in your rafters. No. The enemy establishes establishes himself in one place. Right between your two ears. Right inside of your head. You might not be able to see him, but you can feel the after effects of him being there. He establishes himself in our heads because he creates a scenario. He puts an idea in there. He maybe even proposes a lie that we think is the truth. And then what he does is he stands back and he waits to see what's going to happen. So he gets inside of this space here, which could be anywhere at any time in any place. In fact, it could be here right now in this church. And he's going to wait to see what you're going to do with the idea and the thought that he's put inside of your head. So the first thing is, we have a spiritual enemy. The second thing is this, your mind is the enemy's target. Satan has one goal. His goal is to destroy your mind and to tear down your thoughts. That's it. If he can destroy your mind and tear down your thoughts, then he's achieved his mission. John 10.10 says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And we keep hearing that over and over again, but listen, it's from the inside out. Sometimes we can't even see everything that's happening on the inside of us, or we can't see anything that, everything that's on the inside of the person next to us. But I'm telling you that I'm telling you, the enemy is putting things inside of our minds to see if he can destroy and kill and steal those things that God has given us from the inside out. To steal every gift and talent that God has given you, and for you to keep it to yourself. To destroy and kill every truth that God has planted inside of you so that you'll walk in lies. And listen, it's not that the devil is smarter than you and I. It's that the devil is more strategic than you and I. 
And he has a plan, and his plan is this, for you and I to talk and act more like him and to talk and act less like God. So you see, his plan is put in place. He knows where he wants to take you. He knows the things that only affect you in your mind, and he knows the things that he can tell you, that he can stand back and watch. Will he, will she act more like me? Or will he, or will she act more like God? I'm just going to sit back and wait for a minute just to see. So the enemy's mission is to find out what you know and do you really know the truth? Stick with me for a minute. Because if you really know the truth, then how well will you hold on to that truth when you need it most? Okay? Can you be convinced to abandon what you don't know? Or I'm sorry, what you know. Can you be convinced to abandon what you know? See, Satan wants to convince us to abandon what we know, to put a little seed of doubt in your head, to have a question that what you've learned and what you've been taught and what you've read through the scripture is really not exactly right. It's really not what God said. What he wants to do is he wants us to question those truths that God has given us because he's smart and he's strategic. And he has that plan in place. And once he, once he finds out what we, he, what we know, he wants to see if we'll abandon what we know. He'll work his hardest to find that out because he knows this very thing, that it's not just that you know the truth, but will you use the truth? Are you going to use the truth when you walk out of here today? I could know every scripture in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation memorized, and I could stand up here and impress you until the cows come home. West Virginia slang. I could do that for you. I could know what God's word says. I could repeat it back to you. But when I walk out of these doors and I go out into my world, into my home, into my school, into my job, into my marriage, into my relationships... Am I taking that and using it? Because I can know anything, but unless we use what we know, it has no effect in our lives. Amen? What you know will only be as strong as what you do with what you know. We can have all the ingredients for a cake. I'm not a baker, but this is what I've heard. All the ingredients for a cake, and we can put it in a bowl. And if it doesn't get in the pan and in the oven, we don't have a cake, right? We can have all the ingredients. So if the devil can get you to doubt the truth that God's put in your mind, get you to disregard it, then he's completed his mission. He stands back and just twiddles his thumbs and says, next, next victim. I'm going to take you to a scripture that talks a little bit about this because this has been happening since the very beginning of time with the very first two people, the account that God has in the Bible of Adam and Eve. Genesis 2 says this, God says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, Adam and Eve knew the truth. God didn't stutter. He didn't hesitate. He didn't waver. He didn't just allude to it. He said, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But we're going to jump ahead of Genesis 3 and see what Eve says. The enemy says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Did he really say that, Eve? The woman said to the serpent, well, yeah, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, I want you to look at this with me closely. You see, God said specifically not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Eve said very vaguely, you know, God said not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. She didn't say the exact words that God had given her. You see, she had already begun to minimize what God had said. She knew the truth, but she began to minimize it because the fruit looked pretty tasty. And she wanted to have a little bite of that. And so instead of saying exactly what God said, she was a little bit God vague and said, well, you know, you know that tree that's kind of in the middle, that's the one God said, but, you know, maybe not so much. Can you hear God just saying this to Eve? Eve, you know better. You know, come here for a minute. Stand here. Look me in the eyes. You know better. 
because I didn't waver with you. I didn't hesitate with you. I told you the truth so that your life would look different than now what it's going to look like. But see, she was beginning to abandon what she knew for what she wanted. And when you abandon what you know for what you want, you suffer consequences of your action. You see, the enemy begins to win because his plan was get, to get you to walk away and to abandon what you knew. And he can steal, if he can steal that from you, then what force do you have to work with? You know, you might be saying something like this, well, it's not that bad that I'm flirting with my coworker. I mean, I know that I'm married, but man, he just gets me. He understands me, we can relate to each other, and he makes me feel good, and you start to abandon the truth and what you know for what you want. You know, I, I know I shouldn't be drinking, I have an addiction, I know that I shouldn't be messing in drugs because I've been in rehab, but man, if I just go to that bar for one night, what's it gonna hurt me? What's the big deal? We start to abandon the truth of what we know for what we want. And, you know, see, God's word tells us what we should know, that his truth is moral, it's foundational, it's true, but every single day we have a choice, don't we? Every day, yeah? We have a choice. We have a choice on what we're going to decide. Whose truth will be our truth? And so many times we take God's word, which is absolute, and we make it optional. And I think that's where we get into some problems. We take the word of God that says this, this, and this because he doesn't waver. And we say, well, maybe he didn't really mean that. Maybe I can push the envelope a little bit and still say within the guidelines just enough so I look like a Christian enough, but God's moral truth is not really in, in me. Because you see, we have this battle that's raging in our minds and it's between this, the truth that we know and what we want. Anybody? What we know and what we want. And sometimes the enemy knows what we want even better than we do. So he puts the idea in there and he starts messing with us a little bit and he starts just putting those ideas in our heads and we start to believe it as our truth. Remember we said in the beginning there is no our truth. It's God's truth or no truth, amen? It's God's way or no way, right? It's Jesus on the cross or not on the cross, amen? It's like what he says, not what we say, right? So what do we do? What do we do about this? Number three, Knowing God's truth and living it out will keep you strong against the enemy. Sounds so easy. So what's our greatest strength against the enemy? It's not just how much we know, but it's how well we know it and then live it out. How well we know what we've learned and how well we walk out of those doors. I always look at these doors, not these doors, just these right here. So if you walk out these doors, you're in this message. Those, I don't know so much. So if you walk out these doors and you go out into the neighborhood, just as I said earlier, how are you living the truth out? Listen, can I, I have to just be real about this today. This is so foundational that many of you may go, oh yeah, I know about the enemy. I know what he does in our heads and all this, but I'm telling you, it is the number one thing that we, every one of us struggle with. Every one of you right now, there is a struggle in your head that you're dealing with. It could be, I don't know Jesus, or it could be my marriage is falling apart. It could be my kids, I've tried to bring them to church and they don't want to be here. That's a struggle for you. It could be, you know what, I'm not where I want to be, I'm not where I used to be, but man, I don't know if I want to put the work in to be this, to walk this walk the way I want to. So every one of us is allowing the enemy at some place to, to be able to take over the thoughts because he's got a plan for us. But what I want to tell you is this. You have the power to overcome any thought that's put into your head. He does not have liberty over you. He does not have power over you. He doesn't. He doesn't. We don't have to be afraid of the pitchfork fork in the ears. We don't have to be afraid of that guy. All we have to do is remember that God's truth in our hearts and in our minds will prevail anything that the enemy tells us. Are you with me right now? Okay. Okay, I just had to throw that in. All right. Breathe in and breathe out. James 1.22 says this. Don't just listen to God's word. Do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. I feel like God is calling us fools. I'm not calling you a fool. I would never do that because I love you, and I'm afraid to call you a fool. So I'm not going to call you a fool. 
But God calls us fools because he's God and he can do that. If we know the truth and we don't live it out, we're, fool, we're fools. If you know something and you don't live it out, what's, is it worth even knowing? Think about that for a minute. If you know it and you don't apply it, what good is it? What good is it? God's truth says this. I have a purpose for your life. And you're upset that you don't get the job that you want. How well are you living out what you know? God's truth says you are totally and fully forgiven. And you keep living in shame from your past. How well are you living out what you know? It's about what we know, what the truth is. God's truth says you can do all things through my son, Jesus Christ, and you stay salty because you're having a tough time in your breakup? Come on, somebody. How well are you living out what you know? God's truth says this. You forgive people not seven times, not ten times. You forgive them 70 times, seven times, and you're still holding on to that unforgiveness from 20 years ago. How well are you living out what you know? I hope I don't look like I'm angry, like I'm... Yeah passionate about this. Here's why. It's something we all struggle with. I struggle with it. When I was preparing this message yesterday, I was struggling with it. God was speaking to my heart. What are you holding on to? What are you doing that's not my truth? Come on, Linda, you got to get it together just as much as anybody else. So I say this because this is foundational for every one of us. I don't care if you've been walking 50 years with God or you've been walking one day with God. You're going to deal with this for the rest of your live long days. We got to talk about it. I just don't want to look angry doing it. So I'm going to Maybe Botox, like that whole thing. So while you know the truth, you even repeat the truth, sometimes you abandon the truth, the truth when life gets real and you're up against a hard place and a real situation comes up and you disregard the very thing that God taught you and showed you to be able to use to be able to get through that particular thing because the enemy will challenge you. We're going to repeat that. The enemy will challenge you in the place where you are for what you know. You know, Linda, that seems a little bit extreme what you're talking about today in the church. I feel like those people really don't need to hear that. Or maybe you're sitting there and the enemy is saying to you, wow, that's extreme. I don't really need to know this today. Like, this is too much for me. The enemy will challenge you. You know, forgive somebody 70 times seven times? Does she know what they did to me? Does she understand the hurt that's inside of me? I'm not going to forgive that person 70 times, seven times. You see, what are we going to do, do with the truth? And you know what? You who's sitting here today, you say you're forgiven, like God's telling you you're forgiven, but you're not really forgiven. Like he's holding the comparison litmus test up between you and the person next to you because you're not quite as good as that person. He'll never see you in the same way that he sees someone who's a leader in this church or someone who is, is, is in this church, has been here for a long time. You see how the enemy does it? Right now, at this very moment, he's casting doubts in your head about something, either something that's spoken or something that's happened. But you need to hear this. The devil is a freaking liar. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. There's no truth in him. There's nothing he can say to you that's valid. You cannot abandon God's truth when you need it the most. We got to just stick our feet down, draw the line in the sand, say, I'm not abandoning the truth of God when times get tough. I have to combat his lies, the enemy's lies, with what God's word says. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm going to step forward into it. And I want you to remember this too, that while Satan has a plan for your life, God has a plan for your life also. God has a plan for your life. And whoever's plan you agree with is the plan you end up with. Whoever you agree with is the plan you end up with. God's plan, Satan's plan. There's only two, one or the other. You're either walking it or you say you're walking it and you're not walking it. If you want to have a life that God has planned for you, then you have to get into agreement with his word. Basic 101. You have to begin to get in agreement with this word. How do you do that? You have to know it and you have to live it. Here's what I believe. We need to start walking like we know we're the righteousness of God. 
We need to start talking like we can do all things through Christ. We need to start speaking, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Amen? We've got to start speaking and walking and being confident that we are the light of the world in the dark places. Amen? We have to start believing that. And let me just go here for a minute. Can I just go here for a minute? Okay. Sometimes we abandon God's truth so that we can make other people comfortable in their weakness. Maybe we have friends who are not living God's truth, so we abandon God's truth because it makes us more comfortable in the circle that we're running with. Maybe we know we shouldn't be out at the party, but we're going to abandon God's truth because I would rather be with this set of people than maybe just the one Christian friend that really loves me for who I am. But man, that's just one person. But man, I want to be with all these 20, 30 people that, you know, we just have a party and we have a good time together. We're abandoning God's truth. So, you have to decide who will you agree with and when will you back up when it's not comfortable. That's a tough place to be. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm, I've been there and I'm sure most of you have been there. If you've walked this walk for 10 minutes, you're going to come up to somebody who's not going to be comfortable with who you are. But remember, you know better. Look at the person next to you and say, you know better. Oh, that, we need to speak a little louder than that. You know better. There you go. We cannot shrink back in order to not look smarter, to not look holier, to not look more like we're um, attached to God's word. We have to start saying things like this. I want to be a person of integrity. I want to be a person who knows the truth and lives it out. I want to be a person, I want people to see that I hold God's truth within me. I want to be a person that when I walk into the room, all the negative comments stop. All the gossip subsides. All the criticism about other people begins to fall back because the people know when I walk into a room that I hold God's truth inside of me and they don't want to be around and they don't want to talk about people when I'm in the room. Because others will start to see that I know better. And who will they turn to in times where they need someone who knows better? It'll be me. It'll be you. It'll be you. It'll be you. We'll be the ones that will carry the torch for God. And they'll come to us and say, you know what? You didn't waver when your son was messing with drugs. You didn't waver when your marriage was in trouble. You didn't waver when people talked about your church and said it was a cult. You didn't waver when you didn't, you didn't waver in anything that you did. And what I see is that you're taking a stand and you're taking the moral truth and you're putting it inside of you. And you know what? When I have a hard time, I'm going to come to you. You're who I'm going to come to. Are we those type of people? Are we those type of people who are ready to take the torch and be the light of Jesus in this dark world? Are we ready to take the stand? Are you with me on this? Are you with me on this? What I want to do in our time that's left... God is good, isn't he? I'm just breathing for a minute. I want to give you some things as we close out this message. I want to give you some handles. I want to give you some examples because I've talked about a lot of stuff. I've talked about that we have an enemy. He works between our head and that we have to walk and know and live the truth, okay? I want to show this in real time and show you what this means. So we're going to start with some lies. The first lie is this, and you might be struggling with this. My past is dark and unforgivable. The enemy has shamed you into believing that your past is too dark and that you cannot be forgiven. Maybe you're believing the lie that the pain that you struggled with, the failures that you did, the things that you did in your past, that you need to walk in shame, even to this day. But God's truth says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, say with me, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. 
if you want to hold God's truth inside of your heart, you have to spe start speaking things like this. I am forgivable. I am changeable. I am capable. I am moldable. I am lovable. God sees me as the apple of his eye. I am loved by a limitless God. You are able to be forgiven, and your past is never too dark to be in a place where God's going to love you. He loved you before you were even born. He loved you before you were even a spark in your mom and dad's eye. You have to be convinced of the truth, namely that you're not your sin. You're not identified by your sin. That you're not what other people have done to you. Think about those two. Whatever you've done, whatever has been done to you, you are not looked at by God in those two realms. We have to accept that our past cannot change but with God, our future can. Amen? Our future can. God is just telling you, if this is for somebody today, just come to him as you are. Don't worry about cleaning it up. Just come to him as you are. Line number two, I can't pray to God myself. Listen, you have direct access to God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, you have direct access to God. You don't have to go through someone else. There are some religions that say you have to go through people. You don't have to go through people. God said, you come straight to me. Because what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God. And he said, you have access to me through my son Jesus. I've given you this opportunity so you can come directly to me. God's truth says this. Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father, who sees everything, and I put in parentheses, everything you do, will reward you. Go away by yourself. Shut the door. Get in private. Have a conversation with God. Talk to him about all that's going on in your life. Listen, someone else does not, someone else's prayer for you doesn't reach God better than you. Someone else's prayer doesn't mean that it's stronger than yours. Why we get together and pray and why I love to do that as a church, I don't want to negate that at all. Because I think when we come into agreement, God is there with us where two or three gather. And what we're doing is we're supporting and we're lifting one another up. And we're saying, you know what, I'm here for you as you're walking this walk. Because I see you're trying to keep the truth in you and I want to come alongside you and help you with that. But it's okay at two o'clock in the morning when your tears are falling on your pillow and you don't have anyone else to talk to and you don't have that phone a friend that you get on your knees beside your bed and you begin to pray. You say, God, you know what? I've got direct access to you. God, you're the healer of my heart. God, you're the one who will take over my thoughts and help me to understand the right way to live. You can pray directly to God yourself. You can pray directly to God yourself. Line number three. I can't be honest with God about my struggles. Newsflash. He already knows your struggles. He already knows. He already knows. So why not go to him? As we said, you can go to prayer. Why not go to him with the struggles? Why not take that time to talk to him about every temptation that you face, every heartache that you've dealt with, every difficult circumstances, every conversation, tough conversation that you've been in, every hurdle, every addiction, every bad choice that's going on in your life. Take the time to seek him about that. Get honest about your struggle. Do you want to keep, do you want to be in the same place next year that you are right now? I don't. I don't want to keep struggling and dealing with the same thing that I dealt with 10 years ago. If we're in still in that place, we got to go through some things here. we got to find out what God says about us, and we got to be real and truthful and honest and talk about those struggles. Because if right now you're in the same place right now that you were a year ago, you need to come and talk to one of our prayer partners, and let's help you a little bit. I don't want to see anybody in the same place a year from now than they are right now. I would love it if it was six months. I would love it if it was one. I would love it if it was today that you walked out that you were different today than when you came in today. See, we're not here. God's not playing games with us. Can we remember that? God's saying, I need you. I need you because I'm not there on earth right now. And I need you to be my witness. So I need you to understand that if you've got some struggles, you need to come to me and let's work through that because I need you to be a light in a dark place. And I need you to be strong when other people are weak. And I need you to be the person that people come to. So if you're struggling with it and I'm not helping you in any way, how can they come to you to get help to, to, to even find out who I am? Does that make sense? God's truth says this. Matthew 8, 11, 28, I love this. One of my favorite verses. Then Jesus says, come to me, 
all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He's going to give you rest, struggles that you're facing. He wants you to just come to him and just let him know. Start that process. You're not less spiritual because you have troubles. You're not less of a Christian because you have troubles, because life is hard, whether you're a Christian or you're non-Christian, whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you don't, life is hard. So let's share the struggles with him. Being honest about your struggles takes down the barrier of perfection. How many of us are walking out with the facade? How are you today? Great. I'm so good. Thanks for asking. What if we got real? What if we got real? I think we'd find out what a mess many of us are. Step one, be honest with God about your struggles. Step two, find a friend in this church that can come alongside of you, and we will help you do that to be able to get through whatever the struggle is. Amen? Amen. Line number four, serving and leading in the church is only for the super spiritual and super strong. Well, I could see how you would think that. Oh, nobody... Was that not funny? I was jo totally joking. Like, I'm not super spiritual. I'm not super strong. We all deal with things. But I think the misconception is that we believe that people who are in leadership, people who are in the church that are in the forefront, have a different life in some way that we do. Sitting in church week after week can have us believing that those who lead are super spiritual, without problems. They're stronger than me. They have their act together when I can barely keep my marriage together. That's not me saying that. I can, my marriage is all right. But many of us are at that place where we can't even keep it together, and we're looking at people that are in the church that are serving and leading, thinking that they must have it more together than I do. The truth is, as we said, everyone struggles. Everyone needs grace. Everyone needs accountability. That's a word I'm going to land on for one second. We talk about God's grace. We talk about his love and his mercy. But let's talk for one second about accountability. Accountability is that place that you go to where you have someone alongside of you who's helping you in the struggle that you have. So when we have a church like this and we have all of the different things that are happening in this church, we need someone to help hold us accountable not to reprimand, not to tell us we're so terrible. We don't have to do that. I already know how terrible I am. Amen? Right? I already know how terrible I am. You don't have to tell me that, but what I need is somebody to hold me accountable in my struggle. So we need that. We need to tell God about our struggles, but we also need to have a church that holds us accountable. God's truth says this, for you have been called to live in freedom. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. What better place than to serve in the house of God? Amen? What better place? There will always, I'm going to give you some comfort here for a minute. There will always be people who might be 20, 50 years ahead of you in their journey. But I want you to remember, wherever you are right now, there are always people that are going to be behind you looking to you just like you're looking to that person. So do you see how this is like a revolving door in a big circle? That as we begin, begin to believe God's moral truth, that people are going to look to us just like you're looking to other people to say, oh, they must have it together. Someone's going to look at you and say, you must have it together, girl. You must have it together. Because they're walking this walk. They're talking this talk. They're acting in a different way than I've ever seen them act before. They're handling their problems differently. They're allowing God to invade that place where they were struggling before. Do you see how it works? There's no one in this church that is above anyone else in this church. We just don't operate like that. We are all on level, level playing field, but we do have positions that help move the church forward. So if you're looking at the leaders or the people who serve in this church as having it more together, a lie straight from the devil. But we are called to be on the journey together to be able to serve together. Amen? The last one is this, the last lie. God doesn't love me because of my behavior. This is the one that breaks my heart. This is hard. This is a hard one for me because it keeps people from seeking God. It keeps people from walking into the doors of the church. It keeps people from trying to find a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes they feel like there's no hope, and the hope, man, the church is the great hope of the world, the local church. God doesn't love me because of my behavior. See, God's love isn't based on your behavior. God's love is based on a savior. And God's love is based, is unconditional, and it's limitless. 
There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you could have done. There's nothing that you have done. There's nothing you will do that will keep his love from penetrating you. You see, God, I hear people say all the time, you know, God's just so distant. He's so far away. I don't even know where God is. Well, you know, the funny thing is God has never left. God is all present. So God is here right now. And my question is, have you stepped away from him? Have you pulled back away from him to the point where now you don't feel him anymore? Because remember, we talked about your prayers. You can pray to him. You can talk to him about your struggles. All of these things. Are you doing this litmus test that can help you to understand he is not far from you? He is not far from you. He sees everything you do. He sees every mess up that you made this week, every difficult conversation that you had. He sees every child that's, that's causing you, making you crazy in your family. He sees the relationship struggles that you have. He sees it all and he's not mad at you. I want somebody to hear that today. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. He's just not mad at you. He's not looking at ways to punish you. He doesn't have the spiritual wooden spoon like I did. He's better than me. God cares about you. He will never remove his hand from you. He'll never pull away from you. He's passionate, he's loving, and he's forgiving. And his truth, God's truth says this, Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still in our mess, while we're still in our brokenness, While we're still in that place where we don't feel worthy, we're still in our addiction, we're still in our struggles, our financial struggles, we're still thinking that we look like we're on the corner and that we can't be saved. I want you to know that God said, before you got your act together, I loved you. Before. And he still does. John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved us that much that he gave his son. Your, think about your child. Would you do that for the rest of creation? He did that for us. So God does not change, but we change. His love for you does not change, but we change. Even when we sin, when we fall away, when we refuse to believe, when we doubt, the love is there. God loves you in all of your flaws, in all of your brokenness, in all of your sin, in all of your craziness, in everything that's inside of you. He still loves you and he sent his son to die for you because you're worth it. You're worth it to him. Everyone in this house, you're worth it to him. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise.